Mr. Bank and Jim Carr, the Coleman A. Young Endowed Chair and Professor of Urban Affairs at Wayne State University. Um, Ralph and Walt will first present their papers and Jim will be our discussion today. You can read all about all about these three very impressive people in the bio that has been provided. This month's data talk investigates how changing demographic trends will have major implications for housing and mortgage lending. Ralph will discuss um, his office joint paper with Jim, Jim, and I indicating that over the next 15 years, most new households will be renters, which is a sharp reversal of trends over the past 20 years. Uh, of the net new homeowners between now and 2030, approximately half will be Hispanic. One paper shows the growing number of homeowners in the U.S., including a quarter, including a quarter of Hispanic with non-borrower non relatives or partners with significant income. Additional income helps borrowers to head against job loss and makes them more likely to stay in their home when the borrower is underwater. This suggests that considering non-borrower income and underwriting can help lower income and minority families without generating excessive risk. And this is the work that lay behind Fannie Mae's very impressive Home Ready program that went into effect this month. Um, Jim will comment on research from both um, the Urban Institute and Fannie Mae, and will also add his own perspective. And at that point, we'll transition over to the question and answer session. So with that, we turn it over to Ross to begin, and then we'll just sort of go successively with no breaks, Ross, then Walt, and Jim. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. For uh, uh, being here today, um, yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Um, well, first, I, I do want to pause just for another second <coughs> and acknowledge the excellent work that June Chu, who's um, in the room with us today in the back, hi, June, and uh, and Lori and I did uh, together. It was a great collaboration. On this work, uh, there are some copies of the paper outside the door. If you want to not saddle yourself with the paper, it's also, of course, available online. It came out um, in June. Uh, most of what I'm going to focus on here in this talk is about what we found out and how we got there. Because uh, Lori has told me that that generally this, these talks attract people who really want to get a little bit into the weeds about how we got the answers that we did. Um, and so we'll save some of the more policy-oriented discussion for the Q&A. Um, but um, so I guess I'd just say, um, you know, I, I hope that sort of serves your needs and what you uh, expected to see when you decided you wanted to come to the talk today. So let me give you the, just the outline. These are the three major sections I'll be going through. Um, I'm going to start by just giving you uh, a few background slides on demographic changes that are growing housing demand, which are, let's say, exogenous to our paper. We're taking them from Census Bureau projections. Uh, I'm going to go a long look back, looking into the early 1900s, the changes in headship and homeownership since early 1900s to kind of frame us up for looking forward. Uh, this is the third section of the paper where I'll talk about um, uh, how we uh, how we frame. Uh, a couple of alternative scenarios for headship change and homeownership change, and what the implications of those are for housing demand in the next 15 years. I love this graph because uh, I like lots of graphs. To me, this is a graph that tells the story of the United States' secret weapon. Industrialized, rich nations, we are going to experience most of the growth in population in the, in the next uh, in the next uh, 40, 50 years. Um, every single one of these new people, we're going to have uh, 16 million for whites, but we're still going to have 100 million uh, more Americans in 2060 than we do right now. Uh, and that, to me, is, is that's, you know, if we look at that and we see all these folks as potentially creative, adaptive, receptive people who are going to build the next version of America, uh, I think this is a it's a fantastic thing, and that we need to do everything we can uh, to maximize their potential to contribute. And ownership, um, from many different perspectives, at a certain point in the life of the course, 
being a tremendously important contributor to their own prosperity, but also to national growth and national prosperity and stability. Looking at the, at the long view at a population that's becoming more diverse, and looking at the segments of the population that have not been able yet to attain a full level of uh, citizenship, at least culturally and socially, that white non-Hispanics have because they have not had access to home ownership. Um, this is both a challenge, an uh, opportunity, uh, and potentially a risk to the United States if we don't take it up. Another big challenge, maybe it's, a, it's an opportunity, challenge I don't know, is that we're going to have um, over 80 million seniors in the year 2040. We're under 50 million seniors right now. Uh, the American city has been built for and by the baby boom. And in the next 30 or 40 years, we're going to continue to innovate in what the city looks like, what tenure looks like, what homeownership and headship look like. Uh, because the baby boom is coming to the senior ages, and they, uh, we, uh, will, will change the face of homeownership. So thinking about uh, even something as simple as as how longevity will affect uh, both headship and homeownership rates, but then playing that into where we want to live, how we want to live, uh, that's going to be uh, a, a tremendous challenge and potentially an opportunity to build these and, and metropolitan areas that are more inclusive and that offer more opportunity for various kinds of tenure, so a million seniors in 2040. I'm going to start at the end and just show you um, where we think that um, renting and ownership, um, where we know what's gone in the last uh, 20, 25 years and where we think it's going. Um, uh, the projections that we've done suggest that the millennial generation, which is larger than X, is still hasn't completely gotten out of their parents' homes completely. People who were born between 1981 and 1995 in, in our analysis. Um, uh, are, uh, they're, they're renting now if they are out of their uh, parents' homes. They really won't be starting the transition into homeownership in big numbers uh, until the early 2020s to mid 2020s. They're really generating most of the growth in housing demand, and because they're young and they're diverse, they're going to rent. Um, so we'll have a very large increase, um, according to our analysis, uh, in, in renters between now and 2030, um, about 7 million between 2010 and 20 and almost 6 million between 2020 and 30. Uh, meanwhile, we'll still have steady growth in the number of homeowners, about 4.5 million uh, new homeowners by these projections. And this is, this is the projections. We'll sort of see where these are coming from in, in each of these two decades. So we're not predicting the end of homeownership. We're just predicting or projecting that because of the demographic moment and the recent economic crisis, uh, rental demand is going to outpace uh, um, homeownership demand. And uh, catching that demand and understanding the rental demand, keeping up with it, uh, make sure that these renters uh, have affordable uh, housing to live in and, and income and economic security while they're renters uh, is one of the best ways, uh, in, in my view, that we can prepare them for the transition to ownership that they um, often will want to make. To those of you who aren't necessarily doing this from a demographic standpoint, what's a household? It's an occupied housing unit, sort of the same thing. Every occupied housing unit has a household in it. There's an entity there. So when you know the population and you know the tendency of that population to live in housing units together, you can figure out things like uh, the, the headship rate, which is just the number of reference people, which is usually the person who holds the lease of the mortgage to the unit. Uh, in a particular age group, let's say, or maybe of an age and a race group, uh, an age group and a race, as a as a proportion or a percent of those in that age group, sort of at large. So that's the headship rate, just the number of householders per person, uh, usually measured um, by uh, by these by these age specific groups. Okay, I'm going to explain the home ownership rate. It's just it's, uh, that's that's pretty that's pretty clear. Um, but both of these two things are, are important components in our method and in, in the way that we're thinking about where the housing demand is coming from. So, so let me start with the look back. Um, and, and this won't be all that, uh, all that. It won't be very slow. It won't pause very much. I just want to get a couple of big messages across. And that's the one that's on the headline of the slide here. That's for most groups, uh, age groups, um, headship, that's 
a tendency of people to form households of their own, peaked in 1980. Uh, it's been sliding since then. It's peaking a little bit later for the older groups, uh, and that's because people who are in the younger groups peaking in 80, and then they're sort of sustaining their headship tendencies into their older years. Um, and so there's a little bit of ripple effect as one moves through the age cycle that sort of translates uh, into the years. But this is uh, since 1980, headship is coming down in a secular way. It came up a bit between 1990 and 2000, uh, ha having dropped pretty fast in the 1980s, and it came down um, uh, again uh, since, since 2000 and, and pretty precipitously between 2007 and the present. How much of this is cyclical, crisis-related, and how much is secular is hard to figure out, and that's why we build scenarios Instead of uh, instead of having a firm uh, portion, uh, all seniors uh, meanwhile have been uh, gaining steadily in headship because of longevity. Um, and I, I think it'd be interesting to talk about uh, both indications of this trend, how how long and how far we think it might extend, with, um, uh, and how we ought to model it with uh, with alternatives given the growing number of people over 85 in the population in the next 30 years. Here's one way to look at home ownership that we've had two eras since 1900. This goes all the way back to 1900 right now, um, in which we had a low, uh, lower home ownership regime uh, that lasted until World War II, basically, and then we had the innovations and, and inventions uh, of the New Deal that allowed people to get mortgages more easily, plus a rising national economy that allowed white, uh, non-Hispanic uh, to uh, increase their rates of um, ownership quite dramatically, of course, leaving African Americans behind for a lot of reasons related to discrimination, uh, where they were uh, where they were living, uh, and uh, uh, all kinds of structural racism that's, uh, that's that's baked into American society even even today. After 1960, when we got up to about 62 percent, there's been kind of a new plateau, where we were running along for a while. We increased a bit in the, in the late 90s, early 2000s, and then we came down. But abruptly, but over the long scope, probably not all that much. Um, uh, a little bit in the last in the last few uh, in the last few years. So that's the, sort of the long view. But if you look at it and you break it out age by age, um, we see that it's really the aging of the baby boom that's created by the show. Age for age, again, home ownership's peaking in about 1980 for most age groups under 55, and for a lot of different reasons. Um, that was a high watermark. So the baby boom is kind of the, the, the weird period. It's the unusual period. Uh, and we're, you know, we're, we're entering a new period now where millennials are coming up, and they may have kind of different uh, tendencies and abilities, and, uh, and we need to sort of take out how that might be changing. Meanwhile, senior homeownership um, among those 75 and over may just be starting to peak now. Uh, so seniors are, are staying in their homes for longer, and their homeownership is peaking later. Meanwhile, younger uh, younger adults uh, are um, have been have been declining for some time, um, even before the housing crisis. So to look back. I, I wanted to do this just because it was kind of fun. Um, but here's people who were um, born in 1885. Um, 1885 was their birth, and so this starts uh, in the year 1910. 25 years old and um, goes up until they're 85, which would have been in 1995. Not so many of them left by that time, but you know that's a, that, that's the, the first uh, look. And I'm just going to sort of go 10 year by 10 year here, and you can see this is sort of one regime, but it's being steadily with the New Deal to a different regime where people are able to make the transition into home ownership much sooner than their their, their parents and their grandparents were. Sooner still, and that's about where we are in for those who were born in 1935 in the middle of the Depression. Uh, again, uh, those who were in 1945, the first baby boomers. And now look what starts to happen. The old baby boomers, like me, they're getting there quite as fast. Just a little less fast. The millennials, less fast still. So I'm sort of thinking instead of just rates, thinking about trajectories into home ownership, the transition to my next part, uh, into my next uh, the next part of my my talk here, which is um, looking ahead to demographic change and housing demand in the future. I start with this image, and I want you to put yourself in your mind at the starting point of the Army 10 miler. 
Uh, some of you in the room are probably runners, and you can easily imagine yourself there. Maybe you were even there in October, running the Army 10 miler. You have friends who were. You can picture yourself being fit on a beautiful day in October. You just start and run your best race ever. You probably don't feel like you could have kept up, like you know me. I'm not sure I could have kept up. Maybe it's a great day. It's looking like fantastic conditions. Maybe you even have a little bit of a tailwind coming up behind you. It's going to help lift your feet a little bit. You'll get to the, the finish line a little bit sooner. Uh, you and everybody else, you know, but maybe there's a headwind. Maybe a storm in the middle of it. So, so it could be that everybody in the pack is going to have an easy time or a hard time relative to their average ability to run uh, to the finish line. And there's going to be different capacities to run. You know, some people, you know, maybe it gets really hot in the middle of it. And there's certain people who are really sensitive to those hot spells, and they have, they have to, you know, they have to slow down, take a water break. Maybe they even pass out and can't finish the race. So I'm thinking about this as a metaphor for, for uh, the, the transitions, both into headship, be, becoming the head of your own household, the, own, the owner of a house, or the, the lessor on a, on a, on a lease. Um, uh, it's sort of being like running a race. It's a transition that you make. Uh, at, over the life course, and if the conditions are right, uh, you may be able to get into headship and homeownership uh, faster. Uh, if you're stronger, you may be able to get them get there faster. But if all of the odds are stacked against you and it's a bad course, uh, it may be it, you know may be a lot slower. So it's sort of a metaphor that I that that sort of works a little bit better for me than assuming that just because someone's 40, their certain homeownership rate. Because homeownership rates like a mile marker on a race. Right, and expect them to get to that mile marker and <coughs> blowing 40 miles an hour in their face. And that's really what we're the difference between the 1970s and the, sorry, the 1990s and the 2000s. So, Lori and June and I, when we're looking at this, when we're working on this, we're sort of we're thinking about how should we model. Um, we want to know what the starting point is, the starting line, and we want to know what the speed of travel is, which is a transition rate from one uh, year to another year. Uh, for the people who start the race together. So these are transition rates for people who begin the decade at the age of 15 to 19, 15, 20 to 24, 25 to 29. You see here a couple of different things. One, for, uh, for this is headship, sorry, not homeownership. So this is the head of transition. You can see how important it is to make that transition into headship for people who are between 15 and 19 years old at the beginning of a decade uh, and how much, how responsible they are for the growth uh, in occupied housing over that 10 year period. Uh, those plus the folks who start out in their early 20s um, really make up a very large share of the people who are starting. So that's that's sort of like, you know, we expect people to form households in their late teens, starting in their late teens, early, early 20s through their late 20s, early 30s um, over time. So that's point one. Point two is the pretty big difference between that regime which is the baby boomers transition regime, a regime that we've been in really for the last uh, 10 or 15 years. Um, and furthermore, the 90s are pretty different from either the 80s or the, or the 2000s. The 90s was a fast transition decade uh, relative to either the 1980s uh, or the 2000s. Um, and as we look for um, future rates of headship, um, we're going to be looking to the transition rates, right? How fast were people going in the fast and the starting points, which is where are they right now? Um, these are two points of reference, the 90s and the 2000s. We're not going to use the 60s, 70s because I don't think those are relevant anymore to where young households are today. So, that, um, so that's head shift. So projecting um, head shift, uh, what we did, uh, this is now looking across the board, you can see um, this is 10 year age groups, not just for five years previous slide. So you can see um, how much the gain in headship happens for people who start a decade 15 to 24 years old. That typically is 30 to 35 percent. Uh, between 90 and 2000, it was about 35 percent. Between 2000 and 2010, it was about 31 to 32 percentage point gain right over the course of the decade and the probability of being um, a, a householder. Um, and, and then there's the average between the two for each of these groups. Um, so instead of just picking one or the other, we said, well, let's take two. We think it's going to be as fast as the 90 to 2000 rate because things are just not so good as they were in the 90s, even in an optimistic area. So uh, what we did was we took the 2000s rate uh, for our slow transition into headship, 
uh, and the, the, two, the, 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 not, the average, sorry, between the 90s and the 2000s for our fast transition. And for seniors, <laughs> whose transition into headship has actually been growing over this period of time. So it's always the faster of those two average between the two days or the 2000 to 2010 period of transition. Okay, so this is setting the speed of travel. Um, for homeownership, um, we did the same thing. Looked at the 90s, looked at the 2000s, uh, two very different decades of transitions into homeownership, but generally positive transitions into homeownership, even though uh, your age group, especially for African Americans, may have been losing home ownership. Uh, your cohort, generally in the United States, was not losing home ownership over that 10 year period. Might have gained a percentage point or two, um, might have stayed and wasn't generally losing. So, this is again not just for age group, not just for cohorts, but for race specific cohorts that were tracking these rates uh, in the 90s and the 2000s. Um, these uh, rates of transition into home ownership uh, for the slow and the fast. For, um, and this is just the white non <coughs> example, and you can see the transition out of home ownership for people who are householders uh, over the age of 65. At this point, certification. Okay, let's go on. Um, uh, so I just also wanted to show you the, uh, the the white rates compared with everyone else. I just picked the fast rates here. For a point of comparison, I could have picked the slow. Um, also, it would have, it, I'm not sure uh, how much different it would have um, It might have looked a little bit um, less advantageous for non-whites. Um, but you can see that, uh, for example, African Americans had transition rates um, less than half of the white rates uh, over these two, uh, the two decade periods for the 15 to 24 year olds and a little bit less um, in the, the 25 to 34 year old uh, 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 cohort. That's during the decade at the age of 15 to 24. Um, and that the other non Hispanic group, which includes mostly Asians and people of um, more than one race, um, actually uh, peak in their transitions in, in their 20s and, and 30s, starting in their 20s and 30s. So, different patterns here, just to show you that there are really important racial and ethnic differences in the transitions, both the headship, which I didn't show you, and into home ownership, um, that we account for by um, disaggregating by race. So, so having set the speeds, a couple of different alternatives, the fast and a slow alternative for transition, we need to define uh, the starting point in 2013, which many of you know is no easy task when you have a variety of uh, different data sources for figuring out even how many households there are, not mentioned homeowners versus renters. Um, so what we did was, um, uh, uh, sort of led by June, we uh, constructed uh, sort of pseudo cohorts and figured out what the homeownership uh, is this home ownership or head, headship? This is headship for white non-Hispanics. Um, what was the 15 to 24 year old headship rate in 2010? And then what was the 18 to 27 year old headship rate in 2013? So-called same group of people. That's the transition over that uh, three year period. Um, Find that headship uh, rate in 2013 gave us a starting point from which we could compute uh, or add an average annual transition rate that we got from the previous uh, so at the starting point, the, the trend rates are the rate of speed, which we turn into per year. Um, after actually doing this, adjusting the ACS data that we're using in 2013 uh, to the difference between ACS and census in 2020, um, you tilt on that if you're interested in Q&A, uh, to project home ownership rates um, and the uh, transitions in home ownership from 2013 to 20. 30 um, on the average of the fast uh, and slow scenarios uh, with increases in home ownership um, uh, accordingly. So I, I don't want to um, pause here. I just want to go to this one, which is adding it up to the number of households by an age. You can see a couple of things. Uh, one, white households still outnumber uh, the other, um, uh, 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 those of all other races. Uh, two, uh, look at the increase in the dark blue bar on top of uh, the number of Five plus households is increasing fairly dramatically over this, uh, well, the next 15 years. Um, but here to see the change, if you look at it, it kind of in this way, where um, the 45 to 64 year olds and then lower than 45 year old whites are declining in both the 2010s and 20s as householders, numbers of households, uh, uh, and the number of Hispanics, African Americans, and others are increasing across all of those um, age groups. Um, we too, 
a very substantial contribution of Hispanics to overall household growth in the 2010s and even more so in the 2020s. Those are in the appendices in the back of the table, so if you want to actually you know, dig in and see numbers and not just pictures, they're there. And here's the number of homeowners by race and age, sort of similarly hard to see here, but if you look at the change in homeowners by race and age uh, from, from 2010 to 30, um, once again, you can see that this is a fairly slow growth decade for white homeownership and for African American homeownership, but, uh, but Hispanics outpace them both. I think they may be uh, larger than both together. Uh, in the 2020s, is actually a net decline in white home ownership uh, as, the, uh, as the older households um, uh, uh, will be growing, but the number in the, the younger years um, um, is, uh, is, is declining by these projections. By the 2020s, sort of say that just looks at a little bit differently. Hispanics, Blacks, Asians, and other non whites are going to account for all of the growth in, in home ownership by these projections. Now, look at renters. And this is, again, sort of the flip side. It's not like, you know, we're going to have no growth in homeowners, but we are going to have a whole lot of growth in renters in the next uh, 20 years. Uh, in particular, the growth in minority populations who are predominantly renters, especially at young ages, uh, means that we're going to have big demand for rental housing between now and 2030. Change in renters by race and age from 2010 to 2030. Um, uh, uh, the 2010s being growth across the board in age terms for all people of all races in the United States, um, and decrease in the younger populations in the 2020s of renters as the millennials start to make the transition from rental housing into home ownership. Um, but the, uh, the, there's going to be a large growth in the 65 plus rental population. Um, this is, to me, it looks like a number on a chart. But every time I sit and think about a growth of doubling or maybe even more than doubling in the number of senior renters in the United States, this is something that we've never really dealt with before, and I, I think the, the, the implications and what we need to do to prepare are, are tremendous and profound. Uh, and and if, if all of you are already preparing, that's great. Let me know what you're doing. Otherwise, we'll maybe do some work together to, to get to there. Um, so that's, that's sort of the end of the, the, the data uh, talk, uh, except I sort of want to do some, some presaging what we, we hope to do next. The overall numbers of increases and declines that balance themselves out in some way at the national level, but we're growing at really different rates across the United States. Um, about a year ago, uh, some colleagues and I did a really project called Mapping America's Futures. It's the first of a series of explorations of future demographic and population change, taking those national census numbers and saying what will happen if the changes in the next 20 years resemble those in terms of who grows where and how much and so on uh, in, in the, from 2000 to 2010. And this is just one of 27 scenarios that you can play with on the website looking for, look for mapping America's futures uh, on Urban's website. You, know, be able to see it. you can see that there are places like Atlanta, Houston, uh, Las Vegas, uh, Central Florida, uh, and even certain parts of the D.C. area that are going to be growing pretty fast. Uh, and there's going to be those who are growing slow and even declining, especially around the Great Lakes. So uh, the dynamics of the housing market suggest that there won't be so much release of housing by seniors in these fast-growing places, which are predominantly younger, except for Central Florida, and there's going to be a lot of demand for people coming in, especially with rental housing. Meanwhile, um, around the Great Lakes, um, there's going to be more release of housing by older households, uh, and uh, not as much take-up because there aren't as many young people in the population. So playing through what the national household and rent change and owning projections look like for American housing markets, not just the American housing market, um, is uh, an interesting challenge that, uh, that we're looking forward to taking up uh, in the next year or so. Thanks very much. I look forward to your conversation. Thank you. 
uh, non-borrower household income um, on how uh, we can change mortgage lending rules to accommodate the families uh, in the United States. And as Laurie said, uh, we whole ready program uh, which went into effect this week. Uh, one of the components of that uh, to take advantage of this research, uh, but part of the impetus for publishing this paper and talking to you is to really, like, not just the reasons why we found it compelling uh, to introduce this provision, but you know, really uh, it just a good sense uh, of the opportunities and promises and associated with uh, these kind of households that, you know, hopefully this is just going to be a conversation and of people forming their own idea programs to address this population. Well, we'll do. So, So, so there's been uh, a lot of discussion in the uh, demographic uh, literature uh, since the Great Recession of uh, a doubling up phenomenon uh, where people who were economically displaced uh, had to move in uh, with other household members or friends. Um, so that's something that uh, people watched over the last several years. Uh, and we know about the slow rate of uh, transitions of the millennial generation, um, continuing to their parents having trouble finding work, uh, this sort of boomerang uh, generation or failure to launch. Uh, so all of these are more phenomena, but, uh, but behind that, there's also a longer term uh, trend where more and more American households uh, of this shared or extended family type. Um, so this actually goes back uh, 20, 30 or more years. Uh, part of it has to do with just people living longer. It's also uh, due to divorce, uh, different uh, people getting together uh, because they're single and don't have a uh, way to make ends meet financially. Uh, and also, I don't know, uh, because of the greater share of uh, immigrant uh, and minority families, um, for which this is more common, even in so it's ended uh, family. Uh, you can think of this like the opposite of headship. So there's more than one adult uh, household uh, besides just a single adult or a married couple uh, with other relatives, adult child, uh, parent, uh, or friend, or, or this would also include cohabiting. Uh, unmarried partners. Um, so people in these households might be uh, combining their incomes or sharing expenses in a lot of different ways. Uh, they might be, uh, you know, groceries or other items for each other, but might be providing child care or uh, elder care for a disabled person. So there's a sort of a variety of ways in which there may be different levels of integration uh, of finances uh, and the way these households operate. Um, but in terms of mortgage lending, uh, all of that activity is really because we're seeing just the borrowers, uh, just the applicants for a loan. So if you're uh, thinking about the underwriting uh, engines, the automated underwriting engines and, and the various uh, relations, say, on debt to income, um, it's uh, probably going to be the ratio of the household uh, payments uh, to the income of the borrower. Uh, or the co bar uh, spouse, if that's applicable. But none of the other incomes or the uh, possible uh, members of the house might be counted. So, so when I started on this project a year ago, I was looking at just what we call board income uh, at Fannie Mae. And so that was one picture, and you're imagining you're renting out a room in your house to a stranger with the kin more to rental income. It's what we call an arm's length relationship. Uh, as I started digging into the data, I realized that that formal relationship where someone might be making rent payments uh, or qualify for a border income provision, uh, a lending program, that that really represented just a fraction of uh, kinds of shared extended household uh, that exist, that it's much more typical uh, to have more of an extended family to have more of an informal and in a situation like that, uh, you're unlikely to be able to include that or 
informal contribution, you're, you're not going to be signing a lease you know, to, to your adult child uh, or your mother living with you. Um, our goal of, uh, was to so understand uh, different types of these households that exist, um, how do they compare to nuclear households, uh, and what would be the prospects for doing something to count uh, this um, or the what we call shadow or applied rent payments or contributions from these other members. Uh, be the risks uh, to a lender of taking this into account because the current weighting uh, on all this other income is basically zero. Um, so, uh, putting this disadvantage. So, uh, is there any way that we can get at least indirect evidence of how households perform uh, are, are paying their, their mortgages at the same rate as other households? Um, This gives the uh, demographic uh, uh, the reason done a lot of good research uh, on multi-generational families and, and has taught the long-term trend where uh, multi-generational families decline from 25% in 1940 to 12% in 1980 and come back and sort of have the inverse thing work where it also peak at that time went down. Um, and so forth. Um, so one of the principles that I found very useful for thinking about these, these households was by Shimori Kamo, a sociologist, and he was looking at data from actually 25 years ago, uh, seeing a very high prevalence of these extended families, and he classified them either as vertical extensions, uh, upward or downward extensions. Uh, so upward would be uh, the parent of the household or the family, downward would be the adult child, uh, horizontal would be, say, siblings people of the same generation uh, in household, and that's something that John was very prevalent uh, for Latino households. So the challenge of getting say about this phenomenon uh, is that since none of the extra income is ever counted on a mortgage application, we don't it's invisible, we can't use any of our loan performance data uh, as they may or within any the other core logic and other databases to understand this. So the two data sources that we went to Get some insight. Uh, is we use American Community Survey um, from, uh, from 2007 forward, uh, the idea of the numbers. Uh, and get at least an indirect view of uh, the dynamic behavior of the households. We went to the American Housing Survey uh, in 2005. Uh, and that's uh, every other year by old survey. And that's, so that's a panel. So it's tracking households uh, one survey to the next. So we can want to see how their income evolves and their relationships evolve and uh, see whether they stick around. Um, so in terms of overall numbers, so starting with the American Community Survey, um, we made a somewhat arbitrary cut um, for what we call an extended income household. Uh, and the reason we make this definition is that we, we want, so does the income of these other uh, household members uh, it'd be enough that it's really going to be more of an interdependent relationship than just dependency, and they're going to be able to uh, give some financial, some serious financial support uh, to that to the head of household. Um, so the company used uh, what we call an extended income household or a multi-income household is a non-borrower adult head income that's at least 30% uh, of the borrower. Um, so the, the tricky point here, this is both with the American Community Survey and American Housing Survey data, is that we don't really see whether uh, in a married couple household uh, with a spouse, whether the spouse uh, is, you know, technically a co-owner is what was the spouse on a uh, mortgage or mortgage or not. Um, so for instance, we just assume that so that we don't overestimate the number of shared families. Uh, we think uh, either a single borrower or a married couple, we call that the core and their income is what we call the core income. And then we get uh, other uh, households, whether they're relatives uh, or a cohabiting unmarried partner or another non-relative, uh, and see what proportion of those have, have this ratio where it's more interdependent. Uh, and, it, and it's pretty big, so it's 15% uh, of all uh, households with mortgages. Uh, and the numbers are quite a bit higher uh, for different mind groups and 24% uh, for Hispanics. Um, 
then bring down uh, by so so who who is this uh, other person uh, with high income besides uh, the borrower besides the head of household? Uh, it's most commonly an adult child, um, but because this is someone who's contributing to income, we have to kind of shift our uh, the view line from like both boomerang generation, like kind of get home from playing video games in the basement, right? You can't find a job, right? These are people who have jobs who have income uh, and significant income in relationships to their parents. So in, in this subset of the EIH is uh, these adult children tend to be older uh, than, than the adult children, uh, students and, and not have jobs. Um, also the domestic cohabiting uh, partner, another big child, and there's also parents and other relatives. Um, both number of, of non relatives. Um, as you know, the renter population uh, to the homeowner population, uh, the proportion of these households with their unmarried partners goes down and the share with non relatives goes down and tends to be more, more with relatives. Um, so, for the regression analysis that we did, we tended to create three compared groups. Uh, on the 30 percent cutoff point into the extended income households and the non extended income shared households. Um, so you can think of those more as interdependent households or more uh, dependency oriented. Uh, and, then the, and then the non shared households. From the ACS, they've been kind of looking to see uh, what uh, metropolitan areas uh, to higher concentration. So it's 15 percent overall. Um, Buffalo, but we see, uh, well, you know, some of the usual suspects that there's, you know, there's a uh, correlation with larger urban areas with higher housing costs in areas with great minority populations. Uh, where this is going to happen? Um, more, more, more pressure and housing costs for people to sell less. So, here this is from the American Community Survey, sort of going through the uh, crisis. Uh, and for this year, and track you know, this 15 percent extended income household uh, versus these non-extended income shared households. And the point here being that um, the, the rate of extended income households has been more steady over time. It's fluctuated uh, since the crash and gone slightly. Um, compared with the minority household, there's this big spike upwards in this more dependent uh, situation where someone uh, without income is moving into that household uh, and taking shelter there, um, whereas that extended income household is pretty pretty flat. Um, basically, not going up very much. Uh, <coughs> um, so, just getting back to the idea that this, this is something that uh, just tied to the recession. Uh, so, who are uh, in these households. Um, so not surprisingly, it would be correlated with uh, lower levels of education, um, driving needs uh, independent of certain factors. It's higher among uh, uh, Hispanic households and Asians. Um, and there's also a big driving factor of uh, single and uh, people, so, so more and a little bit higher for unmarried females uh, living in these households. Uh, so what I want to show you here is, is we were also looking at uh, the questions around who had left the workforce in the last five years. And nuclear households, the responses for people in the core and the size of the core tend to be about the same uh, in the extended income households. The, the core member are about the same relatively low percentages and then uh, higher rates of Shared households, you know, with, with more signs of some past economic distress, uh, having kinds of those uh, non core members. Um, but in the more interdependent extended income households, uh, the rest for the non core members is slightly, slightly lower. Households 
for two income measures, one that core income is just the income. Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, all right. So, um, in income households, their core income is lower than that of nuclear households. Uh, so they're lower than the income spectrum. Um, then we figure out uh, they're lower. So we, we can't. We didn't have any data that specifically said these uh, these holds, uh you know it's on a loan. Uh, but we can American Household Survey that you you were there in one instance and two years later you're not there. Uh, and so we focused specifically on people with mortgages that were underwater. Um, to, to, I cut off uh, 110%. Um, but I know from my experience working on the HAM program and mortgage modification, uh, when you have negative equity on your home and you moved out, it is much more likely to happen because of, of an adverse event, a foreclosure, short sale, than because you paid off. Uh, nothing that we provide some more internal data. So we're taking as our left-hand side variable is uh, tracking whether the borrowers remain in their homes or they've moved out uh, to get past the, uh, the, uh, the coefficients. So this is, uh, these are loaded uh, coefficients on families stay together even when they're underwater uh, and stay in the household versus having moved out. So we're comparing on the underwater uh, holds, these are the nuclear households, uh, and those shared households that are not in income, uh, which stay in their homes more. And then the ones that stay in their homes the most, of uh, the highest coefficients, are the extended income households. And so what we think of here um, is sort of two intended effects uh, that we believe that uh, with uh, even controlling for income uh, and other metric factors, that, that uh, more ills in the household that you're, you're sort of stickier, you have an attachment uh, to the home, uh, and more likely to, to find some way to make things work uh, when uh, you have some kind of stuff. Uh, and some people you can do you don't have any uh, And then on top of that, then there's the we think the, there's the income effect uh, of, of borrowers helping out. So that's why you have the, the three-way effect. Um, where we saw more of a concern was when we went back um, at, uh, at the height of the crisis, more 2007, 2009. Uh, where we saw a weaker effect. Um, and let me explain the difference between Model A and Model B. So in Model B, we have uh, a lot more demographic controls where we're really saying apples to apples. If I had two very similar households, one is a nuclear household and one is a extended income household. Uh, which one's staying in the home more, and, and they're even in the height of the crisis, the extent income households are staying, staying home more often. Um, when there's fewer controls, uh, just, just a few related to uh, the sort of credit-related variables, uh, then uh, we, see, we, we see this uh, diminished effect. So we found different variants on the models to understand sort of this boundary of, of where we start to see more risk during crisis years in an extended income household. Um, and uh, we and look at uh, this alternate uh, one where we restricted our population to basically the bottom half of the income scale, so people in the area, uh, MSA, the median income. Um, then Model A and Model B start to look the same again. So, so our interpretation here uh, is in general, uh, an extended income household tends to be poor uh, and tends to have more household income and, and, and that you at a higher risk level in ways that might not entirely be, be compensated for by some use on a mortgage application by access or credit. Um, but that if you're lending to these households and you're already in the context of a low and moderate income program like home ready, uh, where you pool your overall portfolio is lower income, uh, then that kind of selection effect where, where your sort of income composition would, would not change as much. Um, so then you have strength where all things being equal, that, that extra income uh, is going to help you out. Um, and so, uh, so we did some test of the stability of this income. So in the cases where we could see a whole two-year 
years later and they hadn't moved out, said, well, how have they uh, lost either 5% of their income or, or lost 50% of their income? To what extent um, does that happen? Um, and so when we compare this EIH type income to other kinds of possibly receiving income, like income from rental properties or self employment, um, in all those cases, uh, it's that kind of income they tend to be more more likely to see income losses two years later. Um, and, and then sort of taking those as a reference point when we look at uh, the income households. Uh, and it was more of a mixed effect. And what we see is that uh, the income households are more insulated from a very severe income, uh, which shows slightly elevated risk when we're thinking about smaller drops, which is basically associated with uh, that non borrower So here of the uh, components of household income work. Um, so uh, on average, in, in one of these households, the borrower's spouse income is, is going up. The borrower income may be going down uh, if you're only upon part of that uh, as a part of the overall household. Then, then on, on, on that resource available to, to the borrower uh, is actually going up. So it's to, uh, you know, so the amount of risk that you would uh, take a program like this, uh, so the thing you can do is you simply cap the amount uh, of uh, non borrowing that you take into account. Uh, so that, if, say, the, the uh, borrower, the exchange that the borrower completely lost their job and was totally dependent upon someone else in the household, you know, you wouldn't be qualified then for a mortgage. So you see, with some sort of very natural uh, bounds on this, which I go into more detail in the paper. Uh, there's ways to limit uh, some of the lenders' risk. Uh, so finally, turning to home, home ready, uh, which I talk about in the appendix to the paper. Um, so home ready goes the first toe uh, into this, and, and in comparison to some of the uh, findings that, that we uh, did cover, uh, fairly limited in its treatment. Um, so it, uh, it basically document and verify that some other, uh, adults in the household have this income that you as an EIH. Uh, what happens is with this bare uh, disqualification barrier of 40 percent DCI or back end DCI for the borrower is raised up to 50 percent. Um, to get through that gate, though, uh, the applicant still has to be under, underwritten through our DU engine um, and uh, has to qualify on the basis just of their own income and not. On the non part income. So our core underwriting uh, is not, has not changed. So that's, uh, but, uh, we, we think that uh, you know, this is a good step towards uh, addressing the, the demographic of folks, which is concentrated more in the minority uh, population. All right. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah. I have to say, when Lori came up to the front and started signaling, you're done, I, I could only feel small pain. <laughs> the version of this paper that I had, um, I didn't get to any of the math until page 34. So uh, when she was saying that's it, it was clear to me. I, I was just struggling trying to figure out how you would make the real point of the paper without telling. So at any rate, let me just say I, I found both papers to be uh, really fascinating, and um, my I found them to be uh, really fascinating. And the way I approached them, and in the interest of time, I'm going to really go through my presentation really quickly, since theirs is the original work, and um, and I'll just focus this on focus on sort of what this means to me from a housing policy perspective. So each of the papers I review in three ways. I look at what I found to be the most significant findings, the most surprising findings, and then opportunities for future related research. Um, there's going to be a lot of, of, of uh, overlap between most significant and most surprising, but I, but I, I try to sort of sort them out and, and hopefully you'll see why I do that way. So I'll start with the first one, which from here I cannot see those slides at all. <laughs> Really, excuse me if I'm looking behind myself, but 
I found with starting with uh, Laurie and Company's the Urban Institute's paper that um, between 2010 and 2030, the share of household growth, there will be people of color is estimated to be 77% going up to as high as 88% for the next day, the uh, next decade. And the reason I found that to be just fascinating is that we have for years now, at least a decade, known that the census was projecting that people of color would be the majority population of America by the turn of this century and the middle, middle part of the century. And what's interesting about it is this paper I have at home that, that <laughs> I was worried that was mine. I was but, but I guess the point of this tape really drives home that the future is really today. We know now that the majority of kids born in America are kids of color. But this point out that it's also important at the opposite end, long before we get to 2048 or 2047, uh, that we're really talking about net new households uh, almost exclusively or, or so significantly people of color. So the question is, how do we treat them within the economy? Although the number of homeowners is expected to uh, increase, the actual home ownership rate is likely to decline uh, from today for all households except Latinos. But that's not a great thing to the extent that their home ownership rate is expected still to be below what it was before the Great Recession. And I don't think that anyone representing Latinos in the arena of home ownership felt that 48% was a good number. The third is that the absolute number of renters will increase. Uh, as Ralph said, uh, really turning around a trend going back uh, decades and decades. Um, and I think that there's more to that sort of turning that trend around, which is the wealth that's associated with it. And I'll talk about that in a moment. And then um, the aging of the population, which I think goes, is, is this is really, I think, in many respects, related to Wall's paper, and I'll get to that as well. And then tight mortgage standards actually exacerbate uh, what's happening in the rental market. And what's surprising in these findings is that by 2030, the rate for African Americans is expected to be as low as 38%, as high as 42%, about 40% on average. Um, and um, the, um, the home rate for Hispanic Latinos is expected to be, as I just said, uh, less than what it was before the crisis. And then the final one is the home ownership rate for non-Hispanic whites is also expected to decline. But we can see what home ownership rates look like in terms of uh, non-Hispanic whites still being above uh, 70 percent, at or above 70 percent by the year 2030. Um, and Latinos and African Americans being the fastest home ownership uh, groups, uh, net new homeowners, and a hit of rate, and then the fact that we're actually falling in terms of our actual home ownership rate, again, with the exception of Latinos, some would not call that falling, but some would call it uh, very much increasing. Well, the changes in uh, relations, both and FHA show that this scenario is not turning around. And I really like to commend the Urban Institute uh, almost every time I speak. They've done, I think, the most significant work in pointing out what the current mortgage market and sort of the dismal uh, originations really means for the market and for households over a longer period of time. Um, in this paper is their study that found that between 20, uh, 2007, 2013, there were more than 4 million loans missing from the market. If you bring that forward to 2014, they would have to tell you whether I'm accurate, but I would guess that you could throw in another million loans. Um, and 2015 is still not that much greater either, although we don't have end of the year data. The connection between home ownership and wealth is really powerful. We all know what happened during the Great Recession. Um, Latinos lost roughly 66% of their uh, net worth, um, and that wealth is recovered slightly because of the rise in, uh, in property values, uh, health prices in particular, but it's still not growing. In fact, the wealth for black Latinos is likely, the gap is likely increasing now once again. And 
some of the slides real quickly. I thought this was fabulous. Demos did a study recently. We think about the racial wealth gap as being so significant, right? So the Pew study showed that it doubled for African Americans and just about doubled for Latinos. This study by Demos says that you can actually close the racial wealth gap by as much is 30% by just equalizing home ownership rates. I found that to be fascinating because we constantly think about all sorts of things like how to improve jobs and on and on and on. And in fact, one of the tables that they put out showed you constantly hear one of the most significant ways to close the racial wealth gap is to close the education gap. And it turns out, no, it doesn't compare at all to closing the home ownership gap. And it shouldn't because home ownership is an actual asset that you own. Where once you've got a degree, you still have to go through all the torture of the market to try and get a job and deal with discrimination, et cetera, et cetera. Let me come back to um, opportunities for future research. And to the extent that the projections are based on um, demographic changes, I think we could somehow enhance these projections to look at changing access to credit. That would make the paper even more powerful or a next generation more powerful. And point number two, I say specifically, uh, maybe using the approach that was used to, to estimate the missing uh, 4 million plus households from the housing market using 2001 as a standard, is there a way we could project what the home ownership rate could be going forward to 2030? And the other thing that I think is really powerful from a policy perspective is translating all these rates into money. That is to say, net wealth. Because one of the things that's suggested by both Ralph's uh, real focus was on age, right, and mine is really race, ethnicity, the other side of that picture, and then by 2030, right, they completely merged, um, is, is to understand what does intergenerational wealth look like each uh, 10 years, because it looked like we had a period where every single generation for the last 100 years was um, economically better the day before. I don't know what happened during the Great Recession, but I, I know we recovered from that and everyone was up and up and up. And now we're looking at potentially falling integrational wealth for the median household in America for the foreseeable future. I, I'm assuming that's what happens with the home ownership rate falling, but it would be nice to know. Let me go to Walt's paper and I'll go through this really quickly because he really explained his paper in great detail. Um, one of the things I thought that was fascinating was that I always found that there are these things called double up households and, um, and so there you go, maybe you should find a way to include their income. But what Ross paper does, and I think it, it's fascinating, um, is it tells you that there are all different types of households and types of income and the amount of income you think you would get from a homeowner or the head of household versus the spouse versus the in-law, they are totally not what you would necessarily expect to be at all. I won't go through the details of it, but I was just fascinated because I did this stuff all the time and, it, 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 and I kind of found it mind-boggling. And as I said, it's in a later part of the paper. The second thing is that um, these households are more prevalent in low-income and minority communities. This is not surprising. But what's significant about it is if we are able to actually begin the process of creating a way to include that extended income, then we have the, the potential of really improving mortgage origination for households. And borrowers in EIH households are more likely to remain in their homes even during uh, market turmoil. Uh, that was an important one because most of, of uh, Walt's research was around, goes right through the Great Depression. I would have one point of question or concern on this issue, and that is the um, Great Recession is defined as cyclical, as I read it. And I think it's not particularly useful or it's questionable to me whether we think of the Great Depression as a, as a cyclical event when it was a cyclical, it was a recession that wasn't as bad as the Great Depression. And in fact, in the class of health prices, I think it was actually slightly worse than the Great Depression. Um, and the second thing that's related to that is so much of the modeling is predicated on default or no longer a homeowner, which implies in the paper a loss of a home to default. Um, I'm not sure, we don't have loan product type. How we can conclude that these households did, did less well if they had a 30-year fixed rate 
I put this out as a question, Walt, because I couldn't tell from the paper whether there was any way you were attempting to adjust for uh, for mortgage type because you weren't dealing with mortgage data. So my guess is not. So the one thing that I say to me throws a wrench in the analyses of the uh, of the default propensity for um, for these house for these EA households is if they have predatory loans, of course the default is higher and therefore they may have performed just as well as any other household had they had a 30-year fixed rate. So if I'm correct in that assumption, I think going back and trying to figure out is there a way to watch out the potential of predatory lending in these analyses might in fact greatly improve the propensity of these households uh, through the model to become or to sustain home ownership. And then the other thing is I thought really quickly, I, I don't remember if, uh, if Walt went through it in detail, but there were lots of different ways they cut and, uh, and, and looked at uh, income from who it's from. I thought these numbers, the 30% of threshold tests uh, qualify for an EIH, uh, and the proportion, that the proportion is fairly consistent across all groups. Uh, I found using an inclusive definition, again, I don't think you got a chance to explain that, Walt, 15% uh, for all households, significantly greater for African Americans and Latinos. Um, I thought this was a surprising finding that um, adult children contribute more to household income than do parents. And because you normally think that, well, a double up household with a parent is the kids are having a rough time getting out on their own and actually, kids are actually doing okay if the parents that are not. Um, so I, 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 again, I I commend uh, uh, Walt for all the details. It's really hard to tease out all of the value in it because there are so many slices of, uh, of, of data in it. Um, really, before I go to uh, the, the uh, suggestions for going forward, I want to point out that, that I think I wrote a piece not too long ago on sort of what should the government's role be with respect to restructuring the housing market, and I think it relates directly uh, to Walt's presentation, where he says, you know, the first thing is broad as possible access to affordable mortgage credit by the mid range of credit worthy households, and then there's also safety and sound of concerns and on. But I, but to that, I have always added this slide, which I think is really important, and I think Walt's presentation really drives this home, and as you see in bullet number two of mine, I point out one of the things we need to do is get about developing alternative products and services such as uh, lease to own, share equity. I added a new one there, which is extended family income, because I think Walt's work really lays the foundation for us potentially being able to significantly increase home ownership. And let me just say a couple of other things. We're looking at rent uh, focuses on are going up and up and up. And to me, if it was ever a time for us to figure out how we can leverage low-cost home ownership opportunities that would lock people into a 30-year fixed rent and affordable, that would not only help those immediate households, but it would also take pressure off of the rental market. So I, again, I think the, the paper was really powerful. I, I guess that I'm going to be talking about this paper going forward. I, I think there's a lot to find there. And for uh, future research, one of the things that um, I mentioned to uh, Walt just before we started, there weren't any real elements to my understanding about what the potential of these households, what the potential increase in household home ownership by race ethnicity might be if we made certain assumptions about the underwriting process. So all three of those, um, actually four bullets and one number two. So uh, I guess that was a really good point. That was a really good point. <laughs> um, but I guess all of this comes down to, this part of the paper really comes down to what I have to see is something around what could be the potential of these households in terms of home ownership. First of all, starting the Fannie Mae's program, um, there, there wasn't really a, a, a statement about what they expected into how many households they expected to serve this year. I'd like to see that, but I'd like to see a more broad thing where if we're including um, extended income, what that means for the housing market. And the last thing I'd like to say, yes, and we need housing reform, but there are things that we can do to the market in addition. 
to new products and services right now that could get the housing market back on track, right? Starting with using the most predictive credit scores, um, and the last one, uh, making sure that there's something called a reserve in Treasury that doesn't constitute recapitalization for legal purposes, but let's make sure that if things are going to have to reach back to the Treasury, it's not going to be described as a draw on the Treasury and then several things in between the buyback provisions, et cetera, et cetera. And with that, I will um, take you to Detroit. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all very, very much for three fabulous presentations. Um, all materials from today's talk is going to be posted on Urban event, Urban event page, www.urban.org slash events. Again, thanks to all three presenters. You did a wonderful job. Um, if you do have a, for, for those of you in the room, um, Jeff, Rand, and we're passing a microphone. Um, for those of you who are on the WebEx, um, Please submit questions to events at urban.org, that is um, events at urban.org, and we'll answer it. So again, for those of you in the room, please raise your hand, provide your name affiliation, and we'll provide you with a mic. Before we get started on the question and answer session, though, I would like to give um, both of you a brief opportunity to um, respond to um, Jim's comments. So, um. No, actually, I'd love to hear some some Q&A, um, unless Walt has um, a response. Um, just as, uh, as we discussed right uh, before, is that we actually are starting to do some follow-up work, including uh, survey work uh, to investigate this further. Um, and I, I think we continue to be, as we, uh, we've done this, we continue to be sort of surprised in new ways by the patterns that we're seeing that we hadn't really understood as well before. Thank you. Right. The National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. Uh, I think uh, observations you made, Jim, uh, EA conducted a, a similar study uh, during this year. Uh, they actually forecasted a higher ownership rate, for example, for Hispanics. Uh, partly uh, accounted for by uh, what you said, maybe making improvements in access also uh, looking at improved economic conditions. And their observations based on trends going back all the way back, all the way back to the 80s. Uh, that's that's it. Uh, so the other thing that I wanted to address with respect to um, the other presentation, on, on, it's interesting. They look at the historical data. Other than taking a look at the effect of the loan products that were made during that time, uh, the rate of, his, of ownership for whites and African Americans came down right around 2006, 2007. Then Asian Americans, it came down like in 2008. And finally for Hispanics in 2009, they're off. I wonder to what extent that was accounted by the fact of having extended income. And, and in fact, as you suggested, Jim, uh, the fact that you have multiple wage earners in a Latino household, including self-employment, for example. Uh, to make some observations on the differences between the MBA study and and, uh, um, and the Institute study, and also amplify it on my other observations. So part of the reason why I um, was stressing our method um, is because um, other organizations that are doing projections of headship and home ownership um, are often looking at a past rate of ship that may be race and age specific, but that doesn't account for transition or starting point. And what we're doing, in fact, you know, Jim, you, you said, you know, you're looking at the past rates. Well, it's kind of you know, subjective where you're going to set those transition rates. It's not subjective. We try to be as precise as we can with set, setting the starting point. Um, low and high bounds are based on where we think economy is right now and where we think mortgage lending is right now and what, what we think is going to be happening with young households of various kinds. So, you know, I, you know I, I'd have to say we did our 
met a different way because we like our way better, with more faithful to traffic trends. And it, I think it also gives you better traction on telling stories about what you expect things to be like in the next seven years. Because you know, if, if attaining a certain headship rate for a cohort isn't just like we got to get caught up to the previous generation, but it's path dependent where we are in five years depends on where we are right now. So that's just it seems like intuitively a better way uh, to put it to me. So you can sort of tell stories about the loss of homey among a generation of Latino homeowners. That says it wouldn't really make sense of us to expect the next generation of young Latinos is going to make the same kind of progress in the home ownership that we would have expected had that loss not occurred. And yet you're sort of, you know, it would be the, the implicit <coughs> assumption of saying, well, they're going to just get bounced right back to the previous rate. That just, it doesn't seem sensible. And what we know right now about the headwinds against them, Jim is absolutely right. right? And they need to think about what kinds of policies could be helpful it more likely that those transition rate will increase, that African Americans' transition rate will increase. Um, you know, it's like tell me a story where I actually believe it. Uh, and part of the story again, I think, is also in Walt's paper. The part of the story is well, we're going to change the way that people get access to credit uh, so that there's a different kind of product for them, and they can count different kinds of income. Wow. Okay, let's you know let's be more optimistic in in the transition. But there's nothing that we can do at this point, a starting point, which is, you know, this is 2013 data, and 2014 probably looks, you know, it's just a slow, the, the slow transition into both headship and homeownership has extended for another year, and we're in 2015, and I don't think it's a whole lot faster now. So to, in 2020, they're going to be as, as far ahead as they would have been in 2010. That's just fantasy. It, it's, been, it's a crisis for young households. And we're not going to overcome it that fast. You know, we can talk about whether we should speed things up in the 2020 to 2030 period, but that's storytelling. It's like, so what are we going to do between now and 20, 2015, 2018, so that we can have the kind of robust recovery on both the, the economic side and the ownership side that would enable us to say, yeah, we're going to, we're going to get there. Um, doing it this way is a way into policy conversations instead of being some respond to, oh, the home ownership rate is going to be this, and therefore we should you know, ignore it. No, we don't want to ignore it. We want to say, well, look, this is, in fact, a, it could be a serious problem for wealth generation, not just for African-American Latino households, but for, for the whole United States. It, it has ripple effects because it's such a large share of future um, households, period, in the U.S. And I just want to just pick up on to Ron, because I, I totally agree with what he just said, and an add to that, and that is, one of the things we've needed is to have a, a realistic look at where homeownership is going. And what was missing from the conversation was this detailed headship uh, rate uh, research going out to, like, say, 2030. We now have it. And that's why now we can actually begin to look at building some of the access to credit issues around that because that then becomes the foundation, right, by home, home ownership. Right? by headship rate, by age, et cetera, et cetera, as opposed to just saying home ownership rate generally. But also, to me, opens another research project, which was um, one of that was really interesting was uh, I saw this report done several years ago, and I cannot remember who it was. I actually thought it was HUD. And, but the HUD say, no, we never did that. But <laughs> I'm trying to get them to take credit for it. <laughs> but what they showed was what if we dec what if we um, increase home ownership by 10 percentage point or or by each percentage point, right? What would be the difference in business transactions in the housing finance industry and ultimately in the economy? And so it was one of those things where if we increase home ownership for Latinos over the next 10 years, but they were just working with 10 years, so it was, the graphics part was easy. Um, over the next 10 years, uh, by 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%, all 50%, and uh, what if we close the gap? I know it was so powerful because for policymakers, you didn't have to say, well, what if we just close the gap? But you could say, what if we really work as an industry to, to uh, close that gap by, say, five percentage points a year, or increase this home ownership rate by, say, 2% every year, or 1% a year? 
So I think that that's another piece of research that, that to me would be fascinating. Your, your first point about um, our Latino households and extended, I'm sure I'm not the only one who was looking at that home ownership rate remaining steady right into the crisis and concluding, oh yeah, it must be a result of shared family income um, that you know people are really working together to save that home. But to me, your question also opens the door to what I said already. If those households, many of whom disproportionately were actually dealing with predatory loans, even with the, existing, with the exceptional help, they still fell apart. I'm, my guess is probably a fair amount of those fell apart because of the loan product and not because of the cyclicality of the economy. So and that's something that we don't know, but I think is worth investigating. Yeah, I can. I can. Yeah. Um, so I'll try to actually do what you asked the underwater uh, bar actually a little to you. So, so the Great Recession, and you know, what we like to call economists like to call it a natural experiment. It was a horrible natural experiment, like because putting millions of borrowers underwater and putting them under stress, where a norm, what we call like the one-two punch, the double trigger, where a job loss, divorce, some kind of a life-stressing event, then a normal economic environment, and even in previous recessions. You'd have had, you would have had equity in your home, and you can just make that into a prepay. And that was data that was invisible to us as lenders, right? Now, all of a sudden, all that of it got exposed. And that's what we saw in the HAMP program, is, is that people, you know, were, were defaulting who were underwater and then had had some kind of financial hit. What has been kind of a head-scratcher over the last several years is how many people that stay in homes, you know, how many people, actually how few strategic defaults happened, how much kind of a, a emotional and, and all, all the intangible benefits that people felt, or, or, or just simply they felt it was immoral to, to renege on, on that debt, and they found a way to scrape things together. And, and it could be that, that the uh, income households could be a piece of that, that puzzle that people have been scratching their heads around. And can I comment on that yeah. real quickly? The, the, so I, I don't you were able, well, through your work to tease out um, when you were comparing uh, income families, and not then that by income, because I guess it is complicated, right? But, but but I guess what I was getting at is that but when I read that point about how extended family did not seem to respond negatively using a default option, where homes were significantly underwater, to me, well, but that's the same as my experience for. Um, uh, Howler, low, that they don't exercise that option. And so the extent to which underwriting makes assumptions about, well, if you're upside down on your loan, you're apt to, you know, to use this option to default, just isn't true in black or Latino communities, whether they're EIH or not, because they don't have those many options. And so this house represents a real life for them, and they're going to hang on to it so long as the neighborhood itself doesn't deteriorate around them and become unsafe. So it would be interesting, again, if there was a way that you could tease that out in your study as well. There's like, we yeah. probably have another question or two. Yeah. I said there was an early hand in the back over there. My question is for Walter. Um, I'm doing senior research on, on extended households, not necessarily extended income right. households. And um, I would like to ask you if you have considered uh, controlling for uh, the different types of extended uh, income households. So at the beginning of your talk, uh, uh, there differences uh, between, uh, among uh, these types of households so in terms of horizontal and downward, upward. And um, in my research, I found that there are uh, dis distinct uh, differences across racial and ethnic groups uh, and uh, groups with different civic standards. And um, I think that these are the qualifications when it comes to evaluation of uh, the stability of income. Uh, because if we look at our horizontal households, uh, the income, uh, I suspect income might be a little less stable. 
then for the other types of households. So that's uh, these models uh, um, for uh, different types of products and, uh, you know, different types of research as well. Um, you know, that, that's a good uh, point. We, we didn't specifically uh, pair the horizontal and vertical uh, structures, although that's, that's something that we could uh, look at. Uh, we, did, we did see slightly uh, worse results when it was a non-relative and also not a domestic partner, uh, just a friend or some other partner in the household, but they tend, they tend to maybe separate. Uh, concern as much concern for the borrower, right? Uh, but as it was said, we're, we're, we've been doing some qualitative studies and, and interviews, uh, and I think and, and some survey work, and I think we're going into some of that. Uh, and I think the potential with the horizontal situation where it's a clear inter interdependence, and, and, and that's that it is, it, and where, where it's not a, a dependency situation, uh, maybe easier people to. to Make, make that able relationship. There's a question in front here. Yeah. I don't phrase, but uh, but we'll start to back to it is and we can consider that is if there's an assumption about house price appreciation, which uh, may or not be true. I mean, uh, have been sold essentially in terms of wealth building, equity building, and so forth, but that's large dependent upon house price appreciation. For the first 10 years of a mortgage, almost all of the equity is based on house price appreciation. Now, you know, we want to expect double digits house of price, appre price appreciation. As a consequence, the mortgage lending industry went and they were doing equity lending, not credit lending, for a long period of time. Uh, and then we had a 40% decline in house price appreciation. So the, the question I have if you assume single digit house price appreciation over an ended period of time uh, in, in most places, what's the impact upon that in terms of ownership rate on um, the rental property? So that's all going to have a, a, a depressing effect upon ownership rates. So, and, and, and right, well, it's a whole set. Of, and one other fact is the whole housing ladder shift. You know, they, you know, the buy starter home and move up and so forth is predicated on house price appreciation, essentially uh, uh, allowing you to go to the next bigger house. And if that generation doesn't, if that doesn't take place, it has some severe impacts upon this whole dynamics. So I couldn't actually agree more with you that there has been too much emphasis and focus on the homeownership rate and increasing that rate as a goal. I don't think that ought to be our national goal, just to increase the homeownership rate. I think what we need to do is increase economic security and mobility for households of all kinds. And that involves assuring financial health and stability, starting when people are children, uh, teaching them how and expecting them to have uh, understanding of and being, being offered um, debt jobs when they're uh, just out of high school, if they're going to get a car uh, or college. Um, <coughs> financial health has to be a part of the picture. Rent affordability has to be a part of the picture so that they can put money aside, uh, so that they can make a transition to home ownership if they want to, if they feel like it's a good idea, so they can evaluate, in fact, where it's a better idea for them because it gets them into a better community than they would be in if they, uh, they're renting or if it just gets them under the annual rent increases that I think are, you know, they're already here, right? You know, the, the revenue is going up twice as fast as inflation is right now. So the two options are renting and owning. Getting to a secure housing payment enables you, it sort of insulates you from shocks, especially when, you, when you're in your 30s and your 40s and you have other people depending on your income, as we're talking about here. Really, the, the goal ought to be at least economic security if not mobility, and, and going for home ownership um, could destabilize families um, if that's the primary goal. Um, ability, security, and economic progress for families. Home ownership is a tool for that. Uh, we are a servant in that goal. Uh, shouldn't be the master in that goal. So let's just 
that, I guess, thing by having a debate. <laughs> so, so I agree with everything that Ralph said. I don't think there's a trade-off to financial stability, having a, having a budget, you know, and planning your life. But the idea that the homeownership rate doesn't count is one that with, you know, you, with the communities of color, it just, it's hard to hear that because our homeownership rate right now for African Americans is less than the national homeownership rate at the time of the Great Depression. And that was a period in time in which the U.S. government concluded that it was imperative that we find a way to continue to build the wealth of American households. And in a six-year period, put together FHA, Federal Home Loan Bank System, Fannie Mae, and the Federal Home Loan Bank Board, so the uh, bank corporation. So the idea that, okay, now that group that benefited from those programs is at 70%, now we need to rethink is it's something that's hard to it's hard to consume. We don't need to rethink home ownership. The literature is full of data on the value of home ownership as an asset. It is the single largest asset in the racial wealth gap that exists. It's a fact. It's not a feeling. And as Demos just pointed out with their research, closing that gap is 30% of the racial wealth gap. So leaving that off the table, I think, is not a good idea. And all so the latter part of what Ralph said, I couldn't agree with more, which is stability. How can you better get financial stability being in a, in a, in a shelter, which is your largest single cost, right, except for maybe some exceptional health care costs, which probably most low-income people don't have the money to pay, so it doesn't matter. So stabilize that homeowner, stabilize the housing part, and you can begin to build the budget. But you can't if your rent is going every month and you're moving around playing musical chairs just trying to stay stable. Give it to that. I'll give Walt the last word. Um, just uh, what I saw in my study, just to point out, the, the members of these extended income households actually on average, stayed longer in their home. Uh, they tend to be, you know, it, it's more of a long-term investment rather than just speculation. On average, they had been in that, those homes for 12 years and had bought those homes or obtained those mortgages well before any of the, the bubble had happened. So. Okay. Thank you all very, very much for coming. Uh, that's it. Yeah, no, I was trying to